Good morning, Oak Hill congregation. And for those of you who are here today, not yet having been baptized into Christ, I hope that this lesson today encourages that love and devotion for the rest of your life. Memorable moments just seem to keep happening when you're with Jesus. Mark chapter 6 records another eventful, busy, and heroic day in the life of Jesus. Let's lead up to verse 45 summary uh, in a summary way. Jesus hears of the unjust death, execution of his good friend and prophesied forerunner, John the Baptizer. We could have a lesson just on that. It was tough not to choose to have a lesson just on that. But we've talked about John the Baptizer quite a bit. Very significant, very close to Jesus. Wanting to be alone, but the crowds... Flocking to Jesus makes that a difficult thing to accomplish. And so in verse 34, Scripture says that his care and his compassion for the crowds take his focus for that moment. And in some ways, that was likely therapeutic. But but chapter 6, verse 34, talks about this compassion he has for the crowds because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Think of why he came to earth in the first place, to help each human being know which way to go and to take care of them. So he began to do exactly what his nature and his ministry entailed. He began to teach the words of truth. Jesus loved to teach. He loved to tell people what their souls were craving. God designed us with an innate craving for his truth, whether they, we know it or not. We thrive and live off of the truth, the software program, without any viruses for the body to live in this world. And who are those who have an ear to hear? Those who hunger and thirst after his righteousness. So regardless of the emotions or whatever situation or challenge Jesus was facing, he always took those opportunities to teach people the truth. And his teachings were filling their spiritual souls, spiritual bellies in that sense. But in this occasion, the evening was drawing near and the disciples said to Jesus, now in my words, Jesus Quit preaching, let him go home and eat something. (laughs) And different scenario, different situation entirely. But Jesus then said, it's already too late for that. They can't easily find food, so you give them something to eat. And in verse 37, they think, how can we, with eight months of funds that we don't have, buy 5,000 plus people one meal? It's impossible, (laughs) they think. Well, Jesus says, go see how much food you can find. And the uh, synoptic gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, tells us that they found five loaves of bread and two fishes. Uh, I read a joking type comment, a humorous comment by one uh, commentator. He says, the most difficult part of this whole uh, miracle to come is probably the disciples talking to that young boy trying to get him to give up the food. I'm not sure if that would be the case or not. But nonetheless, they brought it to Jesus. And in a likely practical, I told you so type manner, they said, see, Jesus, here is all there is. And then much to their bewilderment, Jesus said, pass it out. Now, I don't know if a knife blade could be sharp enough to cut down to the molecules to spread just that little amount of food to everyone. But what do you mean, spread this out? They were involved in Jesus' ministry in so many ways, but they learned yet again that little can be much in Jesus' hands. They had all they needed because Jesus was near. The people were grouped together in groups of 50 and 100 to receive the food that was being passed out. And as their bellies were being filled... For every responsible reason, here's a lesson within itself. Jesus commanded the apostles to pick up after yourself. He said, all right, gather the leftovers. And guess what? There were a leftover total of 12 baskets. What a miracle to take just such little amount of food for it to be reproduced miraculously through Jesus' hands, carried through the disciples, and then everyone's bellies filled Plenty left over, enough for 12 baskets. Now, I don't want to read more into a text than is intended. Sometimes there are just incidental details. 
But this is a miracle. Jesus is involved in all the details. We don't know to what degree how much. So if you were to just ask me, what significance do you think is to the number 12 here? Well, we see the number 12 being significant in the Old and New Testament. But just that detail alone makes me... Uh, makes it sentimentally, significantly, symbolically reinforce the idea of Jesus in the past, the 12 tribes of Israel, all of God's chosen children, and now in his body, the kingdom, uh, baptized members in the church. It just makes me realize in Christ, Jesus supplies the need of every soul who are his. Never forget that. In John chapter 6, verse 14, the disciples wanted to make him king right then and there. Now, that was not God's plan. That was contrary to the Father's will. If Jesus had ever had momentum going a direction to be established as an earthly king, it would have ruined the whole mission, and it wasn't the plan from the start. So Jesus takes charge at this point to redirect. We are emphasizing in the gospel account of Mark just how he portrays Jesus as the Messiah that he was supposed to be, the suffering, selfless, heroic servant who was to die to save our souls from our greatest enemy of the consequence of sin and death. The disciples were wanting to make him a king. Jesus says that's not going to happen. He takes charge to change the momentum and change some events. Remember, he's already burdened with some things. And so in verse 45, Jesus instructs his disciples to promptly leave the scene, get on into the boat, go ahead of him into Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. We can both deduce And we can conjecture some motivations that Jesus had to get alone. But scripture says he worked hard to to wrap up the day so that he could get alone. Not only because he loved to each, he already loved that, but to pray. He equally, if not more so, loved to pray. We can learn a lot from the times that Jesus prayed. We don't study that too often. We tend to focus mainly on his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane and the times that his disciples needed to be unified as well as that was. Those stick out in our minds. He said, thank you for the meal every time he also ate. That was significant. But, but what about the times that he prayed like this? What's going on in his mind? We learn to always pray. There are many types of prayers. There are many types of postures in prayer. Sometimes silent prayers. Sometimes people don't even know you're praying, but you are. Pray when you get into messes. Pray on the heels of your greatest successes. On the surface, it seems like this was a great time of success for Christ. And I hope we don't just pray when we get into messes, something like, Lord, Lord help me. But, but this is a time where he wasn't just praying during a, a trying time of his life, although it was. Even here where his power is demonstrated and he was having great success, crowds were praising him internally, it was also very challenging. So he has every reason to go to the Father in prayer. All of the things that he did, it would have taken a handful of hours. It would have been therapeutic, yes, but there was so much going on in his mind. Like what? Well, we've already mentioned the burden of sorrow in his heart because of his good friend, John, had died. The disciples' inability to think spiritually, after all this time still, the crowds wanting to make him an earthly king just because they wanted a handout, and that's another lesson. All of this is in contrast to the Father's will, and all of these good things would only remind him of that. So he had every reason to get alone and pray to the Father for peace and for strength. Sometimes we go through things that no one can understand because of what's going on in our mind. So let's look at verse 47. The disciples' dilemma. The disciples were halfway across the lake. It's nighttime. Jesus is on the mountainside. He has a good view a few miles into the lake. What lake are we talking about? Let's fill the screen with some pictures at this time. This is a beautiful Google search that you can find. Uh, It goes by two names, Lake Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee. It's more like a large lake than a sea. But about nine miles plus across at its widest point, a few steps out, this is not a normal lake, a few steps out, water's already over your head. Halfway out, 500 feet deep. Verse 48 says that the wind was against them. He saw the disciples then with all the currents that he knew they were straining at the oars 
The wind was against them. Jesus sees that they are in need of him enough to do what he's about to do. Now, some people see pictures like I showed you and then the artist rendition here and think, how can such a beautiful, serene, peaceful environment ever turn so violent? Well, the fact that it still does today have allowed people to study this. And let's fill the screen now with some other pictures that just show a, a little bit of information that you can screenshot and read in full detail later and do your own research on. This peaceful sea of Galilee can quickly become a violent storm. Wind funnels through the east-west aligned Galilean hill, stirs up the waters quickly, but more violent are the uh, Golan Heights to the east when wind travels through, gets trapped in the basin, moves across the waters. Back in 1992 is an event that was documented very similar to what they would have gone through. Was this in its own way a type of spiritual attack against them because of the forces they were against? It's an interesting idea. Scripture doesn't say one way or another. But because everything involved in Jesus' life is quite significant, that's an interesting thought to entertain. Nonetheless, Jesus was there. He had a plan. He was going to do whatever he could and should. The boat that they would have been on would have looked something like this. This is a newer model of what they would have been on because of when it was found, but it's very similar. Anywhere from 12 to 15 people. Would you want to be in a life-threatening situation without any hope on something like this? Well, the, as the winds collect, moved across the waters, every fisherman knew the danger. And I want you to feel this idea now. No radar, no sonar, no coast guard, just you and the mercy of the storm. They were straining at the oars. Jesus had a physical view, but obviously he always had divine insight. And from the hours of 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., which is the darkest time of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. Because of my interest, I have to say that modern-day illusionists have spent millions to create the appearance of walking even on calm water. I don't have the money to reproduce some of their amazing, clever methods, but I would never want to do that anyway, lest I imply to people today that Jesus used trickery back then. Uh, they know that walking on water is just not scientifically possible, and it still isn't today. Jesus had already demonstrated that the laws of physics don't bind him when he needs to accomplish the Father's will. He can speedily, now get this, he can speedily move across and even through the boisterous waves when he needs to. It's fascinating, isn't it? Now he's in view of the boat and he's just walking out there. Verse 49 says, when, he, when they saw him walking on the lake, they, uh, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out for fear because they were terrified. I can almost sympathize with them, almost, because I would have felt like them. Of course I would. But then we think with our eyes today, looking back, why wouldn't they have figured out that the lessons learned just from the previous chapter or two? Had they forgotten the experience in chapter 4? In our lesson today, of course, we skipped over that event because we've already preached on it, and yet I will bring some relative, related points towards the end of our lesson today. But Jesus was woken up because they thought, hey, don't you care that we're perishing? Do something to help. And he just says, peace, be still. He was exhausted from that day of ministry. He said, be, be quiet. And everything was still. Did they forget the lessons learned that day? Well, in this moment, there is one big key factor difference, and that is that Jesus wasn't on the boat. And in an otherwise life-threatening situation, their only hope was walking towards them. And they say, oh, it's a ghost. <laughs> the irony of this is that today, even today, Jesus is often fearfully shunned when he's the only answer. When people get into a serious type of predicament, one that they did not bring upon themselves by their own willful, sinful choices. We may or may not think to say a quick prayer of, Lord, help me. And I hope that we do. That's a mess. We always go to the Lord. But sometimes we so easily doubt and even reject the simple answer that's right in front of us. The legitimacy of that being God's way for us. 
Why is it that we're so blinded sometimes? Is it that, our, that we're so focused on our own wisdom? I don't know. But they thought Jesus was a ghost. And whatever your situation or problem is, Jesus is the only answer. His teaching and his truth can be preventative and remedial. He is the only solution for this life. And he will be the only one that helps us go beyond this life. I love Jesus' responses, like in verse 50. He always seems to know what to do in every situation. He says, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. That means that they were terrified. I'm impressed, though, that when people encountered, well, when Jesus encountered people who were frantic, fearful, and distraught, distressed, and uh, just scared out of their wits, Jesus always brought hope of words and comfort to those who were frightened and confused. So to the confused and frightened, he always brought words of comfort. You and I are surrounded by people today, despite their physique and countenance and the image they want to profess and try to you know, express. They're frightened and confused. They really don't know the words of truth that give them grounding and security in life. And we, and I hope that we always follow in the path of Christ and give them the words that their souls are in desperate need of. In verse 51, he climbed into the boat and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. I would be too. All that violent wind stopped the instant Jesus climbed into the boat. Jumping to an application point in Christ, there is no storm that you will not outlive. Well, Michael, what if this storm or that storm even takes my life? The statement stands, there is no storm you will not outlive in Christ. One preacher friend of mine says, I love that little phrase, it came to pass. He says, that's my favorite verse in the Bible, even though it's not really a verse. Because every storm that came, it came not to stay, but to pass. No storm comes to stay. They all came to pass. In Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, the disciples learned of Jesus' power to calm the storms. With a mere verbal command, peace be still. But they also should have learned. Yes, we'll be a little hard on them right now. They should have learned that it's possible to be at peace even during the storm if Jesus is watching over you. If I had only focused on the events of chapter 4 here, uh, I would have brought these points out. Storms will arise. You're not exempt. No one is. In his own way and in his own time, Jesus will take care of it if we seek his will. The disciples... Technically, we're still safe, though in this life-threatening situation, they were still safe because Jesus was with them in chapter 4. And also, it's not a question about God's power or God's awareness. He's aware and he's got the power. So the question, the key is the purity of our faith and trust. But we're focusing today on the events of chapter 6, and so I want to bring out these points. Jesus will be present in time of need. He was on the other side of the lake, halfway over. How is he going to get there? He doesn't even have a boat. Doesn't matter. Jesus will be there in our time of need, and he will help you grow. Think of how maturing this was for every disciple there, but in particular for Peter. Mark's focus on Christ. He doesn't really mention Peter. But think about how that matured him. When he got into the boat and again, everything went silent, calm. The reverent fear would prompt you to worship him. He will increase your desire to worship him by how he sees you through things in life. If we seek his will. And then he will see you through to the other side. Just as young children depend upon their parents to be carried from one place to anywhere else that they need to be, I want to encourage you to please, please grasp the hand of Jesus. Let him be the one to carry you through life, beyond this life. He's the only solution to the storms that you'll face. I would not want to live one millisecond without the peace that comes with knowing I am his and he is mine. I'm in Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. And the question we then ask ourselves is, am I in Christ? 
I hope each of you develop and continue to hold on to and mature a love for Christ that results in you continually giving not just your all, but better than your best to him just because of his love for you and all he's done, giving him full commitment because of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, which we, we not only reenact, but participate in by faith, in that faith response that God the Father has prescribed in his word, the standard in all religious matters, that we come to him unwrapping this gift of grace, which he paid so much for us to have. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, then please won't you come as we stand and as we sing.